Welcome to You Said What? The program where we try to answer the questions that you have on your mind. And if you have any of those questions, please email them to henryroncancio at me.com. Today we're joined by Dr. Bert Alexander, who is the Associate Minister at the Webb Chapel Church of Christ, and also the Chaplain for the Farmers Branch Fire Department, and Steve Steele, who is the Founder and Director of James Group Ministries, a faith-based recovery ministry, and I am Bob Neenstadt. The question for today is, what are the most common lies of Satan? And even Jesus himself gives us an indication about Satan's nature in John chapter 8 and verse 44 when he says the uh, devil is a lie from the very beginning. Jesus said that the devil's nature is to be a liar and uh, that he is the father of all lies. Uh, Bert, what do you think about this question we're discussing today? Well, if, if you go to Genesis chapter 3, uh, is where Satan first is mentioned. And uh, he is, uh, uh, at that point he says to, the, uh, to Adam and Eve that if, um, you know, God said if you eat from the tree of uh, knowledge of good and evil that you would die. And uh, the tree of life, that you would die. And uh, Satan said that you would sh surely not die. Uh, it was enough that he um, convinced Eve to eat of the fruit and in turn uh, Adam ate as well and that resulted in the fall of man. Uh, he is the father of lies. His, Jesus said that his native language, is, when he speaks, he speaks his native language which is that of, of lying and deceiving. Uh, I think that uh, that's just his nature. Uh, that's, that's who he is. He's, he's not going to tell the truth. Steve? In, uh, in, in my uh, assessment of, of lying and uh, trying to figure out exactly the definition maybe uh, that we have, I went to a clinical source to find out there's three different kinds of lies. Uh, there's a commission where you just start making stuff up. Uh, then there's omission where you leave some things out. You don't tell the entire truth. And then there's one called assent, A-S-S-E-N-T. Assent is where you uh, pretend to agree with whomever you're speaking and the point that they're making and making them intentionally think that you agree with what they're saying and you're actually going to do what they're advising you to do. And you do all that so that you might go do what you really want to do, which is more than likely the opposite of what they've told you. And so that started me in a direction of looking at the kinds of lies and what they're going to look like really coming at you uh, when Satan starts to do his best to deceive. And so um, one of the things that I know for sure is that in that definition of that third type of lie, there's intentional confusion taking place there. And uh, I, I do believe that Satan intentionally confuses so that he can adequately lie to you. So if you can look back at a time in your <coughs> life where maybe a lie had been told to you, maybe someone just lied to you and you haven't forgotten about it or forgiven them yet, it's still a very daily part of what you think about sometimes, Look beyond where that actually took place in your past and see if maybe you weren't already confused about that person or about what they were talking about and how that may have worked for you. I think it's important that we understand and know just exactly what it's going to look like when it comes our way. Well, there, there's no doubt that there's a lot of confusion in this world and we even see that uh, coming out of the political arena. arena where uh, what we call it today is misinformation is uh, passed along to the general public in order to confuse and oftentimes deceive. Uh, I'm not saying that our government is the devil, but uh, we know that lies are there and they abound. Uh, what, what do you think that some of those lies would be, Bert? Are you talking about from the government? Uh, no, from uh, just... Uh, a lie that Satan may oh. tell uh, a prospective sinner. Uh, well, I, I think it's it's just the same way it was with the original lie that he told uh, to Adam and Eve. He he tells mostly truth, but um, 
he doesn't tell the complete truth. And uh, as Steve was saying, if, if someone's a little bit confused, uh, they, we have a tendency to listen to the last person we talk to. Uh, and if, if Satan can be that last person, he can get someone who's a little bit confused to uh, come around to his uh, way of thinking, which is always going to, to lead to death and destruction. Um, he, he does this very subtly. And uh, he, he does this in a way that the, the person that's accepting the lie really believes that this is in his best nature, in his best interest. Uh, I think that's what takes place. Mm -hmm. That's correct. That's, I, I agree with that. And I would also have to say that in addition to that, um, we, we really do... Um, we really do have to experience this in reality. We, there's so much of what, sometimes we have a tendency to read scripture and put it so far away from us because it happened so many years ago that we don't have that need, I guess, if you will, to go ahead and try to place that whole thing, that idea in our very uh, presence. What, what would that look like now? How would that look? Uh, and, and Bert, uh, uh, alluded to the idea that he will also use uh, a little bit of the truth to see to it that the lie sinks in. Uh, and so how many times have you been told just a little bit of truth, but the rest of it was not true? That mixing, if you will, of a, that conjuring up of a little bit of a formula for you uh, so that you might believe it. Um, one of the uh, uh, things that I'd like to talk about for a minute, it, a minute is that uh, Satan would like to convince you any way that he can, that you are uh, uh, on your own, that you must protect yourself. And uh, there is no other protection other than that that you provide for yourself. Um, and so there is the leaving out, if you will, of, uh, of, of God and Christ and the Spirit and, and, and even the Word of God. It's really not any good. It's not going to help you. It has no purpose here. It's a 2,000-year-old a novel that you read and it has no power of its own and you're on your own. Here's what that would cause us to do. That would cause us to build our own personal protective mechanism. Now, you understand that when a human starts to build protective mechanisms, they become elaborate and, uh, um, and they don't work really well. Uh, just think about how many times you thought you were well protected because of all the measures you'd taken and something happened anyway. And so at, even in that live, even, even living that way uh, and being the most cautious person in the world, you can become ill, I guess, in your thinking. Um, uh, there was a, a conversation that uh, uh, Dr. Alexander and I were having some time ago about a woman who was so afraid that her child might drown uh, and her need to protect her child had, had spawned from her need to protect herself. And so her idea of protection was to keep that child away from water no matter what. And as the child grew up, the child grew up not wanting to be like that because all her friends were swimming, all her friends got to go around water, there were people with swimming pools that asked her over for birthday parties. It never occurred to her to teach her child to swim. And there is how the prison works. There is where you get locked up in a cage uh, and you're all by yourself and you have no hope. Mm -hmm. uh, I can see where that would be a problem because when we're alone, uh, trying to take care of our own problems or our own challenges even, uh, we tend to revert back to our own nature, our own human nature and what we've been, what we've been taught in the past, what we've learned from experience. And uh, many times that is not good. And we know the result is not good when we leave God out of the equation and, and fail to rely on Him and, and uh, the power that He can interject in the situation. Uh, Bert, what do you think about some more of those lies of Satan? I think that if Satan can get the person to lose their focus, uh, he's already won the game. Um, think back, we don't see it quite so much anymore, but you know, it used to, and it used to be there was time when you'd have a circus come into town and you'd have the, the lion tamer. And that, that always amazed me, that you'd have a guy that would go into 
a ring with several large cats, lions and tigers, and he'd pop a whip and they would jump up on the, uh, the top of a stool or something. They would sit there in an unnatural position and they would roar at him. And their very nature was to eat the guy. <laughs> Just one of them could have destroyed him, but there were several in there and he would have a whip and a pistol as though a pistol was going to Anyway, that, but the, the whole idea was uh, the, what the, uh, the tamer was doing is, is Satan's job. Satan, like the tamer, would get a chair and he'd hold it out in front of that, that lion's face and he'd just kind of rotate it slightly one way or another. And the, the four legs were sticking out and the lion would focus on one leg for a little bit and then it would rotate and he'd focus on another leg. And, and so on, and he couldn't figure out which one to attack. And because of that, he was under the control of the, the lion tamer. Satan gets us to lose our focus and we many times know what we need to do. And we forget that that's what we need to do because of the spell that he gets us under and, and the confusion. And, and many times, it's not until afterwards that we realize, oh, if I would only have done this, I could have avoided that situation. Why didn't I do that? Well, because you were not thinking right. You had lost your focus as, as Satan does like the lion tamer. Uh, I, I really believe that that is a big part of, of his uh, modus operandi, so to speak. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and speaking of lions, uh, the Bible tells us that our adversary, the devil, prowls about like a roaring lion, mm -hmm. right. looking for someone to devour. And so we know that Satan is out there trying to devour us, and that deception, uh, like you said, and, and changing our focus uh, can really get us off track and, and cause us to do some things that we, we shouldn't do. Steve, you have anything to add to that? I would have to say that there is a, there's always an out. Uh, there's always a way for us to defeat that kind of thinking. Um, <clears throat> it's, it's often talked about uh, in Scripture that we should seek uh, uh, counsel, that we should find someone who uh, we trust and have been able to uh, build a trust uh, with that person for some time. To, uh, uh, and give them permission to look at our situation and freely talk about what they see. Um, the, what Satan knows is, is that we don't know what we look like doing what we're doing sometimes. And to have another Christian, another uh, devoted follower of Christ willing to look at what you're doing and help you make decisions is a way to defeat the chair, if you will. Uh, they will be able to tell you, don't pay attention to that, that's just a chair. You need to focus on this and stay focused on this and leave that alone. Uh, that can be done uh, in lots and lots of ways. Um, I, I can tell you that uh, um, evil is, is out to, uh, to attack us with science. Uh, there's been a, uh, uh, not that science is all bad, but uh, we, uh, we have this need because of the science in the world to have some logical explanation for everything. And uh, the idea that everything should work out to be either negative or positive and they all equal zero um, is really uh, a, an art of being able to confuse us and make us think, well, if there's no explanation for it, we're not going to pay any attention to it. So this is simply an effort, do you understand, to remove the idea that there's any mystery in the world. There is much mystery. We have not discovered everything about Christ, about God, about the Holy Spirit, even about the Bible. Once we start thinking that because we've read the Bible and all our scholars have looked at it and it's thus and so and that's the end of it and there is no mystery anymore, then we have built, our, we have built a cage for ourselves and we will not have a key and we will sit in it, do you understand, for eternity. Uh, that, that is a good thought, an amazing thought. That's a you said what thought. <laughs> uh, and uh, also uh, on that same subject, I think that one of the tools of Satan, uh, as far as lies go, is to try and remove all consequences. Uh, 
from our actions. Uh, if he can get us to fall for the lie that there, there is no end result for what we do and there's no consequence for us to pay or for someone else to pay, uh, then it's much easier for us to get involved in the, in the thing that we should not be doing, whatever that is. Uh, and it, he tries to get us to see that there are no uh, results that will harm anyone or even harm us. Bert, you have any other thoughts on that? Well, in the Old Testament, we have a lot of instances, passages, where someone sinned and immediately was, was struck down mm -hmm. for that sin. We, we have the, the, the poor fellow that uh, was following along with the ox cart whenever uh, carrying the Ark of the Covenant. And it, it struck a chug hole and the Ark of the Covenant almost fell off and he reached out to steady it. And in doing so, he was struck down. And we read that and we say, well, that wasn't fair. I mean, why did God do that? If he, if he hadn't done this, uh, you know, the, the Ark of the Covenant could have been destroyed. Well, the point was, it wasn't supposed to be carried that way in the first place. And and he was, he was struck down immediately. We have... Uh, Nadab and Abihu were, were uh, uh, priests and they used the wrong kind of fire and they were struck down immediately. It wreaks havoc and fear in the hearts of those that are around when they see that. We don't see that today. We have people that sin and guess what? They turn right around and sin some more because they're not struck down. And we start thinking because Satan plants the thought, eh, there's really nothing going to happen. You know, you'll not surely die. God might be asleep right now. Maybe he doesn't exist, uh, is, is the lie that Satan's trying to tell you. Go ahead, eat, drink, and be merry, because tomorrow we may die. Well, uh, that's a lie, <laughs> mm -hmm. plain and simple, yeah. because <clears throat> there will be punishment for all sin. And some of that punishment may take place in this life, but it will definitely take place in the afterlife. Steve? Well, you know, there's, a, there's also kind of a, a rule of thumb, if you will, it's awfully evident in our society, and that is that all humans are motivated primarily by money. Yeah. If they say they're not, they're hypocrites, mm -hmm. is actually how Satan sees that whole thing. However, if we look at the life of Christ and what, what value he placed on money, there, he didn't care about money. As a matter of fact, when the rich young ruler was asking him about how can I uh, participate in this kingdom you're talking about, and of course the first thing that Christ said is that possibly you should sell everything you have and give it to the poor and then come follow me, um, he couldn't do it. He was unable. Uh, and it says in there he walked away sad. Uh, and, and I'm, I've often wondered about what he was sad about. Uh, sad about not being able to go with Christ or sad that he now knows what his addiction is uh, and how he's uh, deeply addicted, not just uh, a little bit. Uh, so addicted that uh, the thought of a kingdom with the, with the, with the Savior uh, himself was unavailable to him because of an idolatrous relationship with money. And so we see that. Uh, we see the idea that people want money for one of two reasons nowadays. One is because money brings them power. And those are the stingiest people on the planet. They will not give you a nickel because they would be giving away power if they mm -hmm. did. And the other one is that they will maybe go after money so that they can buy lots of pretty things. And these pretty things have a tendency to make them look good in the world and make them appear to be something they're really not. And so uh, they are very flamboyant about spending their money. They'll spend it to the level of being in debt all the time, but they're buying things to look good. And so this is where Satan went to work, and he's still working there today. Mm -hmm. uh, I know what you mean about money. Uh, just offer me a bonus, and I'll work harder and do more. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's just the way it works, isn't mm -hmm. it? Yeah. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> companies use that all the time to motivate their employees. Uh, anyway, there, there are certainly a lot of lies uh, out there in the world, and the, uh, I think the uh, advertising industry has uh, taken advantage of, uh, of Satan's 
uh, operations, uh, uh, the way that he <coughs> operates to get us to uh, drink the Kool-Aid, so to speak, mm -hmm. to, to fall in line with the uh, making the latest pur purchase, wearing the, wearing the latest clothes, driving the, the, uh, the great car that they're advertising. And it, it's not that they're intentionally lying to us, they're just, uh, it's kind of deception in a way. Uh, to work on our uh, our psyche, to work on our human nature, to get us to uh, to buy the latest product. Bert, you have any thoughts? Other thoughts on that? Well, in Richard Foster's uh, book, Celebration of Discipline, he he goes through several different things that uh, he he uses as a, a rule of life, and one of those things is that you use things. Uh, for their effectiveness, not for their status. Mm. Uh, you know, I, I can get to work in a Cadillac or I can get to work in a Hyundai. Uh, you know, either one of those will provide transportation, but maybe there's more status with the Cadillac than there is mm. with, with the Hyundai. That's, that's the concept there. Uh, we need to make sure that, that uh, we're not replacing something uh, just because there's something that's new and more exciting that we're replacing it because it's old and it's worn out and, and we need to replace it. Right. I think uh, the very idea that the poison is in the Kool-Aid all by itself is deceptive. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. You know, you take a, a, a typically a children's drink, you understand it's sweet and tastes good and put poison in it so that it might do its job. It's typical of, of, the, of the evil part of the planet. Um, uh, you know, marijuana is almost always brought into the lives of the people that end up using it by someone they know, mm -hmm. uh, someone they actually trust. Uh, um, and so are other drugs. Alcohol is sold, you understand, as a social drink, uh, but for those who cannot stop at the social line, and they're now looking back at a line they said they'd never cross, uh, is all justified, you understand, simply because it's legal. Right. And so regardless of whether it's illegal or legal, you're going to have that peer pressure to do it and to fit in. And of course, the last thing any human wants to have to experience while they're here on this planet is rejection. And what they want more than anything else is acceptance. And if you put something in with the acceptance, you have put poison in the Kool-Aid. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, I, I've heard several people say who have an addiction to some kind of substance, uh, they've always said that uh, I started out thinking I could control it. And that seems to be one of the lies that Satan uh, tells or gets us to believe uh, is that we can control whatever mm -hmm. the, the situation is, whether mm -hmm. it's money and embezzling money or gambling or uh, a substance like marijuana or another drug or alcohol, same thing. Mm -hmm. uh, it's just that we can control it. We're in control and that appeals to our human nature of arrogance. Uh, we want to be number one. We want to be in control of ourselves. And uh, it's part of that lie and, and the deception of the lie. Bert, you have anything else? Well, uh, we need to remember Satan was an angel at, at one point, and he led a rebellion uh, against God himself because Satan wanted to be God, uh, and he has always wanted to be God. And uh, he has determined, uh, I believe, that since Jesus has defeated sin and death, he can't defeat Jesus, he can't defeat God, but he can like a sniper, take off uh, different, uh, take out different uh, Christians, individual Christians. Uh, he's not going to defeat the entire church, but if he can get, uh, just going back to the lion analogy again, if, if he can get one of the old or the weak or whatever that's not really part of the herd, mm -hmm. uh, that's what he's going to go after. Uh, mm -hmm. So uh, he, he wants to destroy as many as he can. I think we learned that from Revelation, that he, he understands that he's defeated, but he's gonna take as many down with him as he can. Do you have any final thoughts on that, uh, Steve? All I, would, uh, all I would add to that is this, is that uh, 
he was unable to defeat God, like Bert said. And so uh, the only other way to possibly uh, destroy what God is trying to do would be to destroy his children mm -hmm. and make him watch. Mm -hmm. yeah. Exactly. It, it's a sad situation when we think about it. And uh, as men who are just concerned about you and the fact that we, we want you to be saved, we want your spirit to go back to God, uh, we urge you not to fall for the lies of Satan. Mm -hmm. On our next program, we're going to be discussing what is the source of sin's excitement. What is the source of sin's excitement? Please join us then.